Is this a skill issue? Yeah. So it turns out the only thing more overrepresented on this podcast than developers who play Dota 2 is developers that write OCaml. And as it turns out, you do both. Is that is that correct? That is correct. I play hard support and soft support in Dota 2, and I write a lot of OCaml. I know you as Leo Stara. Is that how yeah. you is that how you're known online? So Leo Stara is actually a username that comes from my grandpa's email, which was Kaostera, like C A Ostera. And essentially it's like my first name, L E Leandro. Ostera is my last name. So online people usually call me Leo, which is not wrong because my name is a Greek compound name that is composed from Leos and Andros. So Leo is essentially part of the root of the name. It's completely fine. But if uh, some people also call me Le or Leandro, like one of those three are good. And you're from Argentina. I am. I am. I'm uh, born and raised there. Live like, but, but with Greek heritage. Years. No, no, no. I don't. Ha I don't have Greek heritage. It's just my. I guess my mom liked that name. So. That's oh, just the name. Okay. Cool. Just the name. Yes. There's a weird mix of culture happening right now because I used to live in Paraguay, so I'm familiar with Paraguayan and Argentine culture. And you're drinking coffee, which is definitely not what I would expect from an Argentine. Yeah. So I guess you would expect me to be drinking mate, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I think <laughs> mate would be the right choice. If I was at home, maybe I'll do that. Right now, I'm cat sitting a, a beautiful cat for a friend. <laughs> so I don't really have all my mate and stuff with me. So I'm just going for the coffee. It's actually just an espresso machine. Okay. I brought you on to talk about OCaml. This podcast has widely overrepresented the OCaml language, but it fascinates me. So that's why that's why we're doing it. Tell me how you got involved with OCaml in the first place. Why are you even interested in this language? Ooh. All right. So I'll try to keep the story short, short to medium, maybe. But I was writing a lot of large systems in Erlang, right? And I started to feel more and more the pain, pain of dynamic languages, of not knowing if a change I was making was actually going to impact the rest of the work I had to do, or even my colleagues, right? Or if, you know, if it was going to be safe to deploy. And if since it was in a fintech, I was scared shitless, right? Of shipping a bug and then losing a bunch of money to the company. I was rather, rather young as well. I had a colleague, Daniel McCain, excellent engineer, by the way. He kept pestering me to learn Haskell. And I was like, I don't know, should I relearn Haskell? Uh, we even got into like some uh, meetup thingies and built a little ba uh, basic interpreter in Haskell, right? Eventually I decided that it was not for me. It just looked very weird and I couldn't get my head around the laziness of the language, right? But I thought the types are interesting. So what is out there like this? And I found Idris. So before writing OCaml, I was writing Idris. And um, Idris is a, a dependently typed language that goes like if you if you grab the type safety knob that, you know, you can go from JavaScript through like Elixir to Go to OCaml, the, the, the last number there is like Haskell. And then after that, you get stuff like Idris. It's like <laughs> breaking the knob, you know what I mean? Uh, Where so you're actually was, just meta programming in types. Is that literally is like, oh, my God. <laughs> The entire program is like a mathematical proof, right? And <laughs> it is mind blowing. <laughs> Surprisingly, they also do run the programs, which is super interesting, right? But um, they actually do compute something eventually. Exactly. Yeah, they compute stuff. Yeah. And I built a couple of libraries like daytime, like the date ranges, for example, that carry the proof, mathematical proof that the beginning date and the end date are actually distinct. And the first one is earlier than the second one, which are like, you, I can do that with two asserts, right? It's like done. <laughs> but no, here it was like that. And um, a lot of that really got ingrained in my head. Like, how do you think with types? But the Idris ecosystem was very new. Idris is still a research language. So I had to dial that knob all the way down until I found something that was safe enough for my taste, a big upgrade from the dynamic languages I was used to, right? But had better of an ecosystem for me to actually build and ship things. And I landed on a camel. I didn't know you could twist that knob. For everyone listening, by the way, I'm just going to recap. We're talking about dynamically typed and statically typed languages, and like famously JavaScript and Python, like dynamically typed. You don't really get to know what types your things are unless you like print it out at runtime. And we're saying that like you've got this knob that represents how statically typed a language is, and you can keep cranking it up. And like Go is is fairly statically typed. You know, OCaml has has more 
type power than go so you can like keep cranking that knob i thought the knob stopped at haskell but apparently you can crank it until it breaks off and you can, yeah, get to this you can go to 11 right you of. can go to 12 <laughs> and today i think you can go even further past that with other languages like agda or lean or cock which i have not their adventure into you're just yet. making up words now i've never i know yeah, these are this could be pokemon <laughs> Okay, so you did this Idris thing, and then you went back, and did you ever ship any production stuff in Haskell or Idris? I haven't shipped Haskell, but I have read a lot of production of Haskell, like doing audits. It does exist. It does, it does exist. Um, I, I don't think I can divulge details, NDAs, but, <laughs> but I have shipped some Idris. I actually wrote, uh, while I was at Spotify, I wrote a little spec for part of the logic of one of the sort of requirements in one of the systems we had that was around dates around like where a particular song is available in the world like sometimes it has to be available earlier than in some other place in the world based on time zones and stuff like that so i wrote for myself a little spec right that was like okay this is how it should work and i had a proof and then it was implemented in python which is the thing that makes sense right but uh, at least i knew like okay this logic is correct and we have a spec <laughs> for that right <laughs> You proved it. You proved it in one language and then actually went and implemented it in Python. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I didn't even implement it, right? Somebody else did. Mm, okay. So I I, in some sense, I feel like, well, maybe this is what these languages are, are made of or for, right? You you prove the thing, you prove the design of the software you want. And once you know it's correct, you go back and implement it in a language that everybody will be able to understand and modify and update, right? That was the most subtle. I worked at Spotify, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, i did i did i did yes <laughs> that's really cool just actually two episodes ago we moved our podcast host from a third party to spotify simply because the only way you can post video versions of your podcast on spotify mm. as far as we could tell is to host with spotify so we're now a spotify hosted podcast and we upload the videos so if you're a podcast if you're a spotify listener and you didn't notice you actually can now watch the video version of this uh of this podcast on, on spotify. that is so cool yeah okay cool so you got into ocaml how give mm -hmm. us some, a timeline like when when was this Ooh. So 2013, I think, I wrote my first uh, airline program. 2015, I landed my first real, like, you're going to write systems in Erlang now. 2016, maybe, the Idris book was released. I remember we got a beta of that book with a friend, and we devoured the book, like, in I don't know, a week. Wow. Wait, sorry to interrupt for just a second to state yeah. my curiosity. You mentioned this, and I totally blew past it. Is Erlang a dynamically typed language? Oh, yeah. Uh, it's strongly typed, but it's dynamically typed. So, you know, variables don't change the type, but you don't know what the type it is until you run the code. Python's the same way. Well, I should say, <laughs> I'm sure they're very different, but Python is also strongly typed, yet very dynamically typed. I had no idea. I always assumed Erlang was a statically typed language just because I've used a lot of RabbitMQ. And RabbitMQ is famously built in Erlang. It's like one of the, I think it's one of the most famous pieces of software yeah, yeah. in Erlang. Yeah, 100%. Uh, like the, and, at least the, the pieces of software that everybody can use, right, freely. Yeah, yeah. And like, it's fast and it does concurrency. And so like those two things together, I was like, fast concurrency, like it it's got to be, be statically typed. Exactly, right? yeah. <laughs> if Go is typed, then this thing has to be typed as well. <laughs> so I think Erlang has done some incredible things over its like 30, 35 years of existence. Maybe more now. It's from 86, I think. And one of those was that they needed to be able to, to swap out, right? The code that was running in a box in like a telecom switch that was in a post 30 kilometers away from the city, right? And they needed to be able to do that without taking down this the, the box, right? They needed to, to connect remotely and swap out the software. And when you need that kind of hot code reloading, which by the way, they basically invented, right? Like in the web, we go like, oh yeah, we have HRM or whatever. It's like these people <laughs> have been doing that from the 90s, you know? It's like before yeah. the web was a thing. That means you cannot really like try to type check your code, right? And then replace it with a new version of that that might have different types. Like you need the flexibility of a dynamically typed language, I think. Like you can't recompile. You just like put code there and run it, right? Well, so Erlang does compile, right? Like, uh, but it doesn't compile in the same sense that like, I don't know, Go does or right. Camel does, right? It like, runs on like a VM like Java, right? Exactly, exactly. So Erlang compiles to some bytecode and that bytecode also is, it doesn't have like static types that so you cannot tell like what the types of things are. It's like, here's memory here or there. There are some literals. So sometimes by looking at it, you can say this will be a string or a number, but then that VM is the thing that makes it fast. So 
by keeping the language dynamic, but having that intermediate representation, they're able to optimize a lot of things, right? And then the VM makes sure that it runs crazy fast. But the reliability part, right? That is where the airline programming model comes in and saves the day. Because we have all the languages like that that are not very good for like massive concurrency. Like JavaScript is kind of like that today, right? Very dynamic language that essentially compiles that, right? Compiles down to something that V8 will be able to run very quickly. It doesn't explicitly have like a a bytecode like Erlang does. But then I don't see a lot of people running like massively concurrent Node.js backends, for example. Or concurrent at all. Yeah, people (laughs) use Go, people use Elixir. They get concurrency by like scaling out the number of Kubernetes pods. (laughs) Exactly, exactly. Multiple processes, right? Exactly. Kubernetes is, you know, to most languages what uh, OTP is to Erlang. And it has been also since the 90s, right? Like the ability to do that, that thing, like scale the processes horizontally. Okay, so you did some Erlang and then you did Idris. That You said that was like 2016? Yeah. Cool. And then where did you go from there? Programming language-wise, I picked up OCaml and I started writing OCaml. Then in 2017, I joined Spotify. I was working at Klarna before that, which is the other big Swedish unicorn here. This is why I moved to Sweden, by the way, to work for Klarna. And, uh, and then out there, I was doing mostly JavaScript, Python, Scala, Java you know, usual stacks for a company that size. You don't have a lot of, uh, let's say, creativity. You can't be like, oh, I'm going to use this research language for these things, uh, which is completely fine. It's, I think it's a solid technical decision for uh, a company that size. And on the side, I kept writing OCaml, and then Reason came along. I think Reason came along 2018. I think there was a big global meetup, and I was like, we got to be on that. So I grabbed a friend, and we uh, organized a recent meetup at Spotify. And this is Reason ML? Reason ML, yes, Reason ML, okay. which was, it's a new syntax, or was a new syntax. Now it's just an alternative syntax, right, for OCaml, which is essentially JavaScript. It aims to be closer to Ew. what you would expect as a JavaScripter, right? So <laughs> okay. if you're like, you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's make things look more like JavaScript. Like, what exactly. the hell kind of goal is that? Well, they just want to <laughs> remove friction, man. Like, you know. Skill I, I'm with you. I'm with issues. you. I personally, skill skill, skill, yeah, I don't, I don't necessarily agree with the aesthetics of JavaScript. I don't know. I feel like OCaml is also kind of ugly, but it's okay. It's an I, I'm mostly taste. kidding. Okay. No so worries, they like no make it look more like JavaScript. Yeah. To, probably to like help with adoption, I'm assuming. Exactly. So the creator of Reason is the same guy create, that created React, right? Jordan Walkie. Because you, you should definitely try to bring on at some point. Uh, yeah, so Jordan created a bunch of like React, and he actually prototyped React in standard ML. So a lot of the functional ideas that are embedded in React's model actually come from OCaml, OCaml's grandfather, if you want to call it that. Because OCaml is the like son of Camel, which is the son of keeps going and going until you reach standard ML and ML uh, back from the 70s, right? Uh, and he said, well, we got to remove friction from absolutely every step we can. And so he made reason as a way of saying, we're going to remove friction from adopting the OCaml type system. Not necessarily the OCaml language entirely, right? Just the type system. To recap that just a little bit, standard ML is like the parent of a whole branch of languages, right? And my understanding is, and I could be very wrong here, is that it, it almost is like, the grandparent of like one tree of languages and C is kind of like the grandparent of like another branch of languages. And like, there's some crossover there and whatever, but like, they're like two very different philosophies. I think small talk is like the other one that's kind of always referred to as like kind of this ancestor language that like Ruby, you know, took a lot of inspiration from. And I guess we have lisps as well at some point. Oh yeah. Lisps. Yep. Do lisps trace back to standard ML or no? No, lisp predates standard ML. Oh, okay. And but they have like very different philosophies. 20 years. Lisps are not necessarily functional languages, right? You can do functional programming in them, but they are very procedural. There's a lot of mutable state everywhere. There's a common lisp has an entire thing called CLOS, CLOS, which is the common lisp object system, which has some really weird stuff in it. But it's, you know, they, they call it alien tech for reasons, but it's not my speciality. So I will, I will not talk much about that. That sounds like the biggest, and, and this could, again, could be just like my misunderstanding or, or perception, but that sounded like the most, like the no true Scotsman fallacy of like Lisp isn't really functional because when I learned Lisp in college and like had to write my own little Lisp, it was definitely introduced as like, this is a functional thing, right? We're going to like do recursion instead of 
doing, you know, iteration with loops. Uh, but I could totally see how, you know, obviously it's extremely dynamically typed and to like a Rustation or an OCamler types, I feel like are such a fundamental part of, of functional programming. In some way, yeah. Then again, if you ask someone that writes Erlang or Elixir, they will say like, no, I'm a functional programmer. I don't need types, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, in some way. And then if you ask a Haskeller, they will tell you that OCaml is untyped, right? So it's <laughs> such a big spectrum. <laughs> there's definitely a lot of opinions. Not sure how much production code is getting written in these languages, but there's a lot of opinions are being shipped. I think it's probably the inverse relation there. The more opinion, <laughs> like Haskell has so many opinions. <laughs> Go doesn't have a lot of opinions, right? It's like, and there's so much software written in Go. So. There's like Kubernetes, Docker, Terraform. Everywhere, yeah. everywhere. Yeah, everywhere. Yeah. That's actually not true. Go is extremely opinionated about not having the ability to have your own opinions. It's like this authoritarian, like you will just do it this way. And it's like, it's, it's this very authoritarian, like top down. We have all the opinions. They might not be right, but it doesn't matter. You're going to follow them. When I was just saying this, because in Haskell, like it is the people that have the opinions. The language is like, what do you want to do? You can do anything. And um, that's problematic. Okay, we, we're going to segue now into talking about the Riot Library. I think this segue is really nice because we were talking off the air, so now I'm, I'm gonna bring the audience up to speed, about how in OCaml, you bring your own stuff a lot of the times. Bring your own standard library, right? Battery's not included. Go is completely the opposite philosophy. It's like, Go ships with everything you need. It ships with a tool chain, ships with a standard library. Don't go outside the standard library unless you really need to. Tell me a little bit about that philosophy and why it got you started building Riot. Okay, I'm a little scared to say what I really think about that philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> but, all right, so... Is this a uh, cancelable opinion? <laughs> <laughs> you know, camel terms, you might, I might ruffle a few feathers, but <laughs> here it goes. <laughs> so, well, camel is batteries included, but the, the batteries they include are generic and kind of shit, and maybe they're halfway through... <laughs> They're like old double A's from like the night, like 1995. Exactly. And you really expect it like the ghost style, like Duracell V9 battery, right? Like this going to last you a solid year. Uh, or I don't know how long it would last for a program language. But the problem is that that library, that standard library is incredibly austere, right? It has only very few things that haven't changed in a long time. If you dig through the source code and if you get blame here and there, you will like very frequently see commits that are from like the 90s, right? And that means a lot of things are just named the way they have been for 20 years, even if they are absolutely garbage. Like you have a membership test, right? Uh, in a list to see if something exists, which we would normally, normally say, does this list contain this element, right? In OCaml, uh, it's called MEM, M-E-M. And that's for membership tests, right? And that Obviously. makes perfect sense. Of course, yeah. I knew it, you knew it. Like, everybody knows it, right? It couldn't possibly uh, mean, like, memory or something. Yeah, exactly. Like, do you remember this item list? Like, have you seen this item before? Like, interrogate uh, kind of a method. And that sort of thing is pervasive. It is it is everywhere in the, in the standard library and makes it really hard sometimes to use for some things. Uh, they have some deeper problems, I think, than just the naming, which is already big. For example, in OCaml, the type inference works sort of right to left. So when you have a function and you give it a like a list map, for example, function to map over a list with some function in the middle, and, and you give it that function, right, then the type inference still doesn't know what is the type of the elements of the list. So it cannot really help you know what are the things you can do with in, inside the little function, right, with every item. So you have to pass in the, the list at the very end and then it goes like, oh, yeah, this was a list of integers. Yeah, yeah. So inside the little function in list map, right? You know, usually you have like array.map, you pass a function. And then in there, you're expected to know what the type is of the thing you are about to map over. It's pretty standard in most type languages that you do something like that. I don't know how Go deals with this because of generics. But I, ima I imagine that if you have a like int array uh, map, then you know that it's going to be ints. So OCaml has a problem where the standard library has been built in a way that for some reason, is not very nice for inference, which means a lot of the time when you write out these functions, you're like struggling with the LSP until you finally put the last thing and it goes like, now I know what you're talking about. That's wild to hear from you because yeah. like, like I said, this podcast is basically just an OCaml shill podcast at this point. And both <laughs> Sabine and TJ talk about how great the inference is. So if it I'm is, understanding correctly, 
it, it, it's great like once you write the whole thing but mm-hmm. like it needs that last bit is that what i'm hearing like you need to so, actually type out the whole thing for the inference to work you can't you, you don't just like put the signatures and the functions is that or so the, types and the, the functions inference is great but if you write code that is going against how the inference works you're not going to get good inference right is this a skill issue yeah <laughs> <laughs> maybe just, maybe I should stop writing Okami. All right, I'll, I'll go back to where like it was but a like, good run. I guess, <laughs> I guess what I'm asking is, are you purposefully trying to do it? Like, oh, let me give an example. I've seen a lot of Rubyists come into the Go programming language, and the way they write Go, you know, I think in their minds is great because it's it follows a lot of like the clean patterns of writing good Ruby code. Um, but it doesn't fit the language. It doesn't fit Go. And so you end up getting some pretty hard to maintain, hard to read, weird code. Is is it possible that that's what's happening? Like, are you trying to write OCaml in a different way? Or are you like pretty much convinced that like, no, this is the like idiomatic way to write this like mapping function and it still makes the inference weird? Oh, I'm not talking about code I'm writing. I'm talking about the standard library. Ah, okay. Well, then I, I think we can just assume that it is... Yeah, I, I think they just can't change it now anymore, but it was like somebody wrote it that way. It seemed like a great idea back then. Maybe the inference changed over the last 30 years, and now we're stuck with a shitty standard library. But I guess rounding, like coming all the way back to the point of bring your own everything, right? Like batteries not included. There are several replacement or extension standard libraries. There's one called containers. You got base. You got uh, STD lib by Jane Street as well. I think it's called core these days. Uh, you have one called batteries as well. Even Riot ships his own standard library these days. It's not as complete Wait, as everything else, but on. we... <laughs> <laughs> you made a third-party library yes. for... My understanding is, is it for concurrency? Correct, yes. And you had to ship a whole standard library for the language with it? For some parts of the language. That's um, wild. Yeah, it kind of, to, to be honest, it kind of sucks. Like, <laughs> I wish I didn't have to do that. I wish OCaml was more, it already can be quite the Go of functional programming languages. I wish it was more like the Go, like Go in terms of the opinions. Like, here's the way that you should do things, and there's no room for the developer opinion. But, um, you know, it has 30 years in the industry and academia. There's a lot of code and papers that have been written with it that need to be replicable. So I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. For the record, I did not pay Leo to say the words, OCaml should be more like Go. That was organic. <laughs> that was organic. That was organic. I, I, dude, I love Go. I think it's amazing what people build with Go. I have my pet peeves with the language itself. Yeah. But there's this meta thing above the language, which is what do people actually get to build with it, right? Like yeah. people hate Ruby, hate on Ruby sometimes, but because people have built all sorts of awful and amazing DSLs with Ruby, right? But then look at what the Ruby community has done over the years, right? It's like they have done pretty good for themselves. Well, I should say I do not like Ruby. I'm not a fan. <laughs> but yes, I look at Ruby through the same lens that like I look at PHP, which is like, same. wow, I hate these languages, but holy <laughs> shit, like they're making a lot of money over there. Yeah. <laughs> like they sure Some do of know my how first to build money a SaaS I made application. With both of those. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> what what is this language good for? It's good for SaaS. To be clear, I still wouldn't do it. Like I'd still write my SaaS and go, and I have, but I appreciate that you can build a very good business on top of these languages. Yeah. Um, it's a lot to be learned from that. If we start talking about Riot, one of the things that has allowed us to move this fast has been that we look around at other communities. And I've had a chance to, to do work, like professional engineering work, right? Making a living of software with C, PHP, uh, also Ruby and Python, JavaScript. I've written a bunch of CoffeeScript. All the other languages that we mentioned, Erlang, Elixir, Java, Scala. I haven't written Go professionally, right? But that has given me the idea that all languages kind of suck, but the ecosystems are kind of awesome in different ways, right? So if you know what to look for, you can go find the gems of Ruby, the gems of Elixir and Go, right? And say, I don't need to try to solve that problem from scratch again, because my ecosystem, OCaml, doesn't need like novel web servers. It just needs like reliable web servers. So what ecosystem has a good one out there? Can we learn from that design and bring it to OCaml? So we've done a lot of that, and we've done a lot of that with Go as well. I think this is actually a point that, well, in some ways is not talked about enough and in other ways is like honestly beating a dead horse. And let me let me tell you what I mean. The ecosystem of a language is critically important, I would argue. And I think Go is a really good example of this and Python as well. Go 
as a language is very simple, easy to get started with. There's some drawbacks to that simplicity. I talk about this a lot, enums. Like I hate the lack of enums. It's really weird. I feel like we should have that part of the type system in Go. It would be really nice. The Go ecosystem, the idea that like I can compile it to a static binary and deploy it anywhere, right? Like cross compilation is easy. The standard library is super rich. I don't need to like pick a framework to build an HTTP server. Like there's all these really nice things baked in. Python, on the other hand, I mean, it is dynamically typed. So I will say that's like a drawback of the language because I don't like dynamically typed languages, generally speaking. But it's a great language to write. And this is why I teach new developers um, computer science principles with Python on boot dev because it's just, it's so easy to write. It gets out of your way. Like if you want to build a binary tree in Python, you just, all you have to worry about is like the mechanics of the tree itself. The syntax is like super, super easy. The ecosystem is a fucking nightmare. The schism between Python 2 and 3, if you want to deploy it somewhere, you have to install Python. Like dependency management's a nightmare with pip. But like Django, there's a lot of successful SaaS companies built with Django, just like Rails, right? And so like that's a really batteries included framework that just exists. When you go out to these other like more esoteric languages, sometimes like the languages are really cool and they're fun to talk about on podcasts like this. This but, is going to sound like I'm shitting out on a camel. I'm not, too. and I guess I am. Okay, so like the it's ecosystem, fine. like this is the problem, right? It's like the ecosystem needs to evolve to the point where you can just like start the project, write the code and ship the thing. I think people are obsessed with the idea that because they love a language, everybody should come write a language out of love for the language. And languages are tools. Sorry to break this to y'all. I don't care about your language. I don't, I don't care much about OCaml as much as I don't care about Go, right? I want to be able to do things with OCaml. And I think OCaml is a better tool for some things than Go. But as long as OCaml lets me build the things I want to build, I'll be using it. The moment I can't use it for that, then I'll just switch for something else, right? I have people asking me, hey, should I build my SaaS app in OCaml? I'm like, not yet. There's so many missing pieces. You know what I mean? It's like, I don't recommend it right now. If you're one of the listeners to this podcast that likes to hang out on like tech YouTube, tech Twitter, tech Reddit, whatever, it's important to remember you're in like the 2% of developers that do that. Like the other 98% of developers like show up to their job and they just want to like use stuff that gets their job done so that they can go home at the end of the day and be done. And I'm not saying you shouldn't listen to YouTube, to podcasts, because it honestly does make you a better engineer. It's just important to realize that the other people you're hanging out with sometimes are doing things literally just for fun, not because it's like a great business decision or it's hyper optimized to like further their career. <laughs> and so if those are your goals, like you should just keep that in mind. Thank you for saying that because it's so important to distinguish right between like what what are your goals right when you're starting a company when you're learning a language if i was to start a SaaS right now right i would probably pick elixir because that's one of the languages i feel i'm most proficient in that has the largest ecosystem where i can build most things like this right uh, but it could be go as well just as well i i don't say go because i haven't done that already but i have done that yeah, several familiarity times. familiarity matters a lot exactly yeah. exactly but this is one of the reasons i'm building riot because i want to make ocaml SaaS ready and it's not right now it's not but i really want to make it and i'm not saying other people aren't and i'm not saying the pieces for making a SaaS in ocaml are not there i'm just saying for that 98 percent of developers that just want to show up to the work. OCaml is so far from a, like a turnkey solution. That's sort of what I would like to have it be. To have it be like turn the key and OCaml is up and running. You have a service and off you go. Focus on your business, right? Is Riot a concurrency library or a web framework? That's a great question. Uh, so it's, a, it's actually a concurrency library. So to put it in, in like parallels with other languages, you have Erlang, the language, and you have Elixir. And both languages run on the same virtual machine. So a lot of the common properties of the languages are actually properties of the virtual machine. The concurrency, the fact that it's immutable by default or almost ex exclusively immutable, the ability to scale to millions of processes, right? This is not a property of Erlang or Elixir, it's a, the runtime itself. And on top of that, you have frameworks. In Erlang, there's a couple of frameworks like Web Machine, for example. In Elixir, you have Phoenix and so on. What Riot is, or how it fits in that picture, is that Riot is kind of like the Erlang virtual machine. We're bringing in a lot of things from the Erlang virtual machine into OCaml. Because OCaml, with its philosophy of bring your own everything, shipped tools for you to build your own concurrency models. Instead of saying, hey, we're going to give you Go routines, right? Like OCaml routines or whatever. They said like, well, we don't want to decide for you. So here's the smallest possible thing that you could use to build 
processes, to build go routines, to build whatever, right? Go bananas. And in some sense, that's kind of amazing that the language is so flexible. But now that means as a user of a Camel 5 and above, you have to choose which standard library you're going to use. And then also which concurrency model you're going to use, which you can imagine generates a little bit of a split. It's not as uh, straightforward. Like with Go, you use it and you have a standard library and you have Go routines done. There may be libraries that implement some other things around Go routines, but Go routines are part of the language. Period. So that's what Riot is. It's an actor model, like in Erlang and Elixir, you have processes that are isolated from each other and send messages to each other. That would be like the actor model part. Scheduler for a Camel 5. And by scheduler, I mean, it grabs all those actors. You can, you can have 10 or 10,000 or a million, right? And it moves them around and it sort of balances the load across all of your cores. And it kind of makes your Camel programs multi-core for free, right? It's never exactly for free, but it is as free as it's in Erlang, where if you have 10 processes and 10 CPUs, then it will run one process per CPU. So parallelly, not just concurrently. So that's what Riot is. First of all, this sounds really cool because coming from a Go background, like concurrency, I've become entitled to concurrency. It's like, it's like you know, when, when you have something around for long enough, you just take it for granted. And occasionally when I leave the Go ecosystem, I'm reminded how hard concurrency can be in other languages. So a lot of my listeners to this podcast will be familiar with how Go does concurrency with Go routines and channels in the occasional mutex. Can you compare this, the model that you're building in Riot with the actor model to, are you familiar enough with Go routines to be able to make that comparison? If not, I, I can give it. I think a, so. Okay. Uh, but yeah, if you want to give me a refresher, then I will appreciate that. But uh, yeah, yeah. go for it. And, and I can for the listeners too, really quick, because not everybody is familiar with Go. Ooh, say by the bell. <laughs> okay, so in Go, basically you have this keyword, the Go keyword, and when you use it in front of a function call, then that function will be called within a separate Go routine. And a Go routine, you can think of it as just an extremely lightweight thread. So operating systems have threads, which basically allow you to utilize multiple CPU cores, but they're kind of like heavy. And so what the Go runtime does is it says, okay, you can actually make way more Go routines than you can make operating system threads. So it will actually make a small amount of operating system threads, say two, three, four, whatever. And you can make like a thousand Go routines on top of that. And it will do like multiplexing. So it will like utilize the hardware in a fairly efficient way. And you can think of your, the, the nice thing for the programmer is you can think of everything at the Go routine level, right? Every Go routine is essentially a separate process. And then if you want to do synchronization, you have to use either like channels or some other primitive, like it, like a mutex. So mutex, mutual exclusion locks. This is like the very classical way of doing like threading in C. It's like, okay, I'm going to lock this memory so that only one thread can have access to it at a time. But, but Go introduces this new primitive called channels, which are basically just thread safe queues. So you can have one Go routine sending data on a channel and another Go routine waiting and reading on that channel. And so the, the philosophy in Go is like, we should use channels when we can because they make everything more efficient. There's a lot less waiting involved and everything's more kind of real time and snappy. Thank you for the explanation. That's uh, That maps to the model I had to go as well. The way that Riot implements the actor model is almost verbatim, like the same up to channels. So we don't have a keyword called go, we have a function called spawn. And the spawn function takes a function that will be executed in what essentially is a crazy, crazy lightweight thread. So like a go routine. Like a go routine, exactly. Okay. Last time I measured, it was like 140 words, about half the size of what Erlang process is. I expected Riot to be competitive with Erlang in some things over the years, if we keep, keep it up, right? Once we spin up a process, right, we schedule that process to run on some of the different schedulers that are running on different threads, actual operating system threads. Usually we spin up one thread per CPU, one scheduler per CPU. So your program is composed of processes, Riot processes, just like your Go program is composed of Go routines. So you forget about the OS level of concurrency and multi-threading, Riot does that for you. So when you spin up a process, it will run in a CPU, right? And it may run on any of those randomly allocated, right? So that's the process story. Some interesting things to know about processes is that they are essentially a function execution. So it's kind of like saying, I'm gonna run this function on this isolated context, right? If it blows up, if it like crashes with an exception or something, it's completely isolated. 
So it doesn't actually crash any of your other things. And I imagine Go routines have a similar property. If a Go routine crashes, it doesn't crash other Go routines, right? Yeah, it's just if the main Go routine crashes, then yes. the process crashes. Yeah, that is something we have differently here, where when you create your first Rio process, the one that starts the entire application, every other process is detached from it. So even if like your main process dies, which is usually used for orchestration at first, everything else may continue to live. And we have some other ways of dealing with essentially termination policies, right? How do you close down your system, shut down sort of uh, orchestration and stuff like that, that we're also picking up from Erlang and Elixir because they're great at doing that, right? So that will be up to like what a process is, what processes are about. If you want a process to live for a long time, you essentially make a recursive function, right? So as long as the function never finishes running, then that process will continue to live. And that usually means we have one tiny loop function that it recurs with a state. So you always pass the same state around. If you need to make some change, then you change the state and then you pass it around in the next recursion, right? And that's what a process is like. Um, I'm not sure how people do that sort of thing in Go routines. I imagine you have some global, like not global, but state before the Go routine or at the beginning of the Go routine. And then you have like some sort of loop, like a receive loop with a select on the channel or something like that. Yeah, I mean, you've definitely chosen violence. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. OCaml is a functional programming language. I would expect like this this recursion with state makes makes yeah. a lot of sense. Yeah, um, yeah. It, <laughs> in Go, although like all of my students going through the functional programming language like heard that and they're like, ah, why? <laughs> why don't you just loop with a while? <laughs> yeah. In Go, I, I mean, I guess it depends on what you're trying to do. Like some of the common patterns in Go is like, okay, I'm going to spawn this long, long running worker thread and it's just in a for, in, in Go, we don't have while loops, but we have forever for loops. And just like in a forever for loop, it's going to do something every 30 seconds or whatever, right? You call them forever for loops? Well, I Instead mean... Instead of just like forever loops? <laughs> I sh That's such a better way to say it. <laughs> Come on, go community. Forever loops. I don't yeah, know how anyone else says it. I just make up my own. <laughs> <laughs> when it's written out, it's just for and then the, immediately the bracket. There's no like uh, okay, pause. Okay. So what of those for loops? That's pretty common. Another thing you can do is like range over a ticker channel. So the ghost standard library has this idea of a channel that just on an interval will send a message. And so you right. can ask for a channel and say, hey, give me a channel that ticks every 15 seconds. And you just range over the channel in an infinite loop. And yeah. every 15 seconds, it will do a thing. And so that's that's another common pattern. I think I've seen that pattern in the Bubble T library. I think they're yeah. using something like that for controlling the refresh rate of the TUI application. Yeah. Yeah. Anything that has to happen on like a static interval, that's super common. If it's a more like real timey thing, then that's when you're definitely going to see a lot more of like just like custom channels that are passing messages around. If it's like global state, for example, I have like APIs that maybe log visit counts just in memory on the server, then I'd probably use like a mutex, right? Just like all the Go routines have access to this like shared state and they'll just like lock and unlock the state and increment the thing. Right, that makes sense. So yeah, unfortunately, like we, we have whiles in OCaml as well. So you can say while true, just do this thing infinitely. Um, however, one of the downsides of the language not shipping a specific concurrency model and rather allowing you to build your own is that they cannot decide between cooperative and preemptive scheduling for you. Like they cannot say, we're going to give you a scheduling model that interrupts your code anywhere. You sort of have to build some of that, which at the end of the day ends up being cooperative scheduling, right? Imagine if the Go routine cannot do a forever loop, forever for loop, but rather inside there, you have to call something like yield, right? Every time you actually, you and you have to remember to do that. Otherwise that forever for loop will just like, starve one of the threads of the operating system thread, right? Can you compare and contrast those two scheduling approaches? Yeah, absolutely. So cooperative scheduling, right? And then you have preemptive scheduling. And the first one, the co-op co scheduling is essentially saying, you and I are having this conversation, right? And you don't talk until I say, what do you think, Lane? And then ah, you say something. Okay, you like pass, pass the time over to me to talk. It. Exactly. It's like, I'm done here. Or I'll just wait a little bit. And then you get to do your thing. Preemptive scheduling would be if the editor just says, ah, enough Leandro, and just cuts me, and then it makes you talk a little bit and then cuts you at some point, and so on and so forth. Erlang is, and I assume Go also is, uh, preemptive scheduled. So in Erlang, Elixir, in Go, you don't have to like sneak around these little calls to say, 
well, this will be a good point for the scheduler to like run a different Go routine. OCaml isn't. And historically, we've had cooperative scheduling via concurrency monads, right? Where some library figures out like, oh, this promise or this future, right? And it's right now waiting on like an, um, I don't know, socket to be ready to be read or written to. So now I'll put it aside and so on, right? And that's something that OCaml 5 kind of inherits. There is no easy way of saying, I'm going to have this function like a while true and the compiler will magically know when it's time for that while true to pause so something else can run. So what we do is that we actually offer you a little function called yield. So if you want to write a while true, which you can, then you just got to remember that every now and then call that function yield. So then you tell the scheduler, hey, I am good to be swapped out, to be suspended for a little bit. Because otherwise one while true just like breaks the whole thread. Let me like say this back, especially for our listeners who maybe have only done concurrency in Go, because this is very different. So in Go, in a preemptive scheduling system, you can just like write a thousand different Go routines. They all just do stuff. And the Go runtime is going to be responsible for being like, okay, I've got four CPUs. I'm going to like take these 200 Go routines. I'm going to do like one operation on this on Go routine one. And then I'm going to sneak in an operation on Go routine two. And then I'm going to sneak in an operation on Go routine three. And it like very quickly shifts all the com computations that need to happen across all the Go routines through the CPU. Like it does them all, like it, it multiplexes them all. It does them all uh, kind of at the same time and it's in charge of swapping them in and out. It sounds like with cooperative scheduling, you as the developer have to be like, okay, I'm now at a point where you're safe to like pause me for a second. And now you can like go do some other Go routine or process or whatever. And you as the developer have to like kind of be aware of that. If I don't yield then this, this Go routine is going to just lock down an entire core until it decides to stop. Yes. You can imagine how that is hard. It's a lot harder yes. than... It sounds awful, writing the code. Yeah, it sounds pretty <laughs> awful, yeah. So how do we fix that? Most of the time, the places where you could block are not really like wild truths. I mean, how many wild truths have you, for real, written in like for business applications? You know, like not that many, maybe one or two in specific situations when you like go through arrays or stuff like that, right? Like it loops in that sense. Recursion though, we do recursion all the time in functional programming, but most of the time your processes or your Go routines are going to be blocking on IO. They're going to be blocking because they want to write to a socket and the socket's not ready, right? So how do we fix this? The standard library that Riot ships with, and this is where we go back to the whole bring your own everything, includes TCP listener, objects, TCP streams to be able to read and write data over the wire, right? It includes support for files. And all of these are aware of the scheduling, right? So when you say, I want to write to the socket, we immediately know, oh, this probably will block, so we'll suspend you until that socket is ready. In practice, your code looks completely imperative, like just write to this thing and read from this thing and so on, right? But under the hood, we are doing that scheduling for you. So it's only in the cases where you actually want to do like unbounded, like wild truths or stuff like that, that you have to be like, oh shit, okay, I need to put a yield here. You just snuck in all the yield statements into the standard library. Exactly, yes. <laughs> That's wonderful. I love that. Uh, <laughs> it, is, it is sneaky, but it works. Yeah. No, I mean, that sounds way better than like me doing it at the application level. I don't like the sound of that at all. So hold on, like just to back up for a second. So you personally not only wrote a scheduler and a concurrency library for OCaml, you shipped a standard library, like you, like Ish. just you. Ish. It's not like super complete. Maybe a few other people. So we've shipped a, quite a few things from the bottom of the stack, right? We have shipped a library for doing conditional compilation in OCaml that is getting a lot of love from different people, which I'm really happy about. And it's super nice to use versus the cur current alternatives for that. We've shipped bindings to libc as a library and not complete, but enough definitions to be dangerous, to be useful. We've shipped an async engine for OCaml called Gluon that is, a, is essentially very, very close in design to the async engine that Tokyo uses in Rust. Again, there's no reason to try to come up like invent a new thing. We'll just go and learn from the best. Mio, the Tokyo engine is insane. It's really good, it's really small. It is crazy fast. So we've done very similar in design to them. On top of that, we have shipped a library for composable read-write streams that are similar to the read and write traits in Rust. So they allow you to say, I have a source, I'm gonna wrap, a, wrap it in a reader or a writer, right? 
and then you forget what the source was. And then you have all this flexibility to say like, I want to write a parser, for example, for HTTP, but I don't care where the data comes from, right? So as long as you give me a reader, then I can read from that and so on. And on top of that, we've shipped a new kind of strings for uh, OCaml called byte strings that allow you to do pattern matching like you do in Elixir, which you've probably seen when you do like, you take a string, a string you do like pattern matching with that and you say like, oh, the prefix is that, or I want to grab like the first two bits and stuff like that. But you can imagine it's pretty fantastic for for uh, designing protocol parsers for network applications. Yeah, because everything's like based on what's the first bit? <laughs> like, exactly, exactly. Like, second oh, bit? <laughs> is the second bit like one? All right, then we should read this thing in that way and so on and so forth. So it gets really declarative. On top of that, we've shipped uh, Riot, which is primarily the scheduler and the standard library, right? And, and this will be like the Riot stack. So up to that point, these are like low level things that you mostly are not going to use directly you know, except for the Rio standard library. And on top of that, we've shipped uh, a socket pool that we've uh, essentially learned design from an Elixir library called Thousand Island, which I understand is the default uh, socket pool for Phoenix these days. And also on top of that, we've shipped a web server, HTTP one and web sockets uh, that mirrors Bandit from Elixir as well. And on top of that, we've sh so we have Who two or three more libraries. Who the fuck is we? Who is we? <laughs> It's a royal we. Uh, <laughs> so there we are maybe 25 people contributing to different projects by now. It's, it's okay. going really fast, to be honest. I'm really excited about that. It's primarily been me prototyping the libraries for like vertical, sta like vertical style. Like here's a vertical slice of the web server. This is what we do, right? And, and then trying to document issues and trying to make it as easy as possible for people to read the code, extend it, right? And then because I'm doing all this live on like live streams and stuff like that, People get engaged and they want to learn on Camel. Uh, they just like join and engage. And I'm, I'm really excited about that, that kind of growth that we're having. That's an insane number of projects to work on. So like, are you doing this full time? Like, how do you have time to do this? Well, so I was in between jobs between my last startup that was a build system company that closed down last uh, July, August. Classic startup story. We built something awesome. Nobody wanted to buy it. We really tried to sell it and it was really hard to sell developer tools to developers, it turns out. And um, between October and December, I started playing around with this idea of like the scheduler. And then in December, I was here in Sweden by myself all through the month. And I was like, I have nothing to do. So I'll just start streaming like crazy and just build, 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 build. Uh, so for maybe two months, full time working on all these things, we sort of, can I say the word erected? We erected the ecosystem. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> We've built the ecosystem. Yeah. <laughs> that way. That's crazy. I've learned a life hack. If you want to get good at programming, move to Sweden or Norway or Finland. We have like several students on boot dev that are like in like the top like one percentile of like how much they code per day. They all fucking live in that part of the world. And the only thing I can think of is that like it's 18 hours of darkness or 20 hours of darkness There's per day. Nothing There's nothing to do. to do. There's nothing to fucking There's do. There's nothing like they... to do. <laughs> and so if you yes. live there, you'll just yeah. write code all day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like you wake up, it's like nine in the morning and you have like half an hour of sun and it's cold outside and all your friends are just at home and they don't want to go out. And then you go, like, all right, I guess I'll just code until, you know, midnight. And then, you know, go to bed, get up and repeat. Isn't Linus from that area of the world? Linus Torvalds? Is that Finnish? There's like, there's something going on over there. Bjarn Stustrup, that sounds like a name from that area of the yeah, world. Yeah, it sounds like maybe Danish or, or Norway, Nor Norwegian. But I think he's Canadian, right? Guido von Rossum? No, he's Dutch. Yeah, but Dutch is like over there. <laughs> it's like close. Not to us. Not to us. Am I show, uh, is my American showing where like I just don't understand geography? Uh, Europe is like just all the same thing, isn't it? It's like I mean, it's like a I don't state know, man. or something. Yeah. Northern um, Europe is a cold place. I'm, I'm not even from around here, so I don't get offended by that stuff. It's like <laughs> I just alienated half of my listeners. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, the churn going out people with them. I know that they're different. <laughs> I just thought that it was cold and dark. So, yeah. I don't know. I know um, they're different. I just don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> it's, it's a compliment, really. Like I said, for some reason, great programmers are coming out of that area of the world. It also makes a lot of sense. All the best Dota players come from that area of the world, too. Or at least they did until, like, Southeast Asia. Could be. I am a so. very uh, aggressively mediocre. <laughs> oh, yeah. 
I mean, Absolutely the Americas going. are famously mediocre. Like both North America and Latin America, as oh, far yeah. as I can tell, we're just yeah, like yeah. we're just like not good. No, I mean we we might make a lot of the game, but we're just not for playing it, right? For some reason, yeah. we don't get any better when we play. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I have not improved in seven years. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. My MMR just somehow keeps going down, right? It's like there's an MMR reset. Everybody has zero MMR, and I lose MMR on every match. It's like how are these happen? I don't know. Cool. Well, this is a lot of fun. Anyone that's interested in No Camel should definitely check out Riot. Again, thanks for coming on. Can you just go ahead really quick and plug all the different things that you'd like people that are listening to go check out? You know, plug Riot, plug your Twitch stream, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. So if you want to check out Riot, the best starting point right now is riot.ml. That's a website. The website is a little bit work in progress, but it will keep growing as we add more things to it. Phase one of the ecosystem is sort of the current goal, and we're going to try to get vertical stack, right, that you can build side projects with. Not something you can bank a business on just yet, but something that you can play around and be productive in, right? And I am, I'm hoping that we'll, we'll have that up and running and in good shape in the next couple of months. So you can contribute in three different ways, right? The first one is just uh, using it, right? Build things with Riot Stack, build things with the Suri framework, which is the web framework we'll build on top of that. Even if it sucks at first the experience, if you report us bugs, if you hang out in the Discord with us, we'll get a chance to make it better, right? And you'll get a chance to sort of give inputs on how you expect that to be, uh, which we're very open to receiving, right? Uh, the second way of doing that will be to contribute by actually picking up some of the good first issues. We have a roadmap page, which will be linked in the Riot ML website. So you'll be able to go there and see like, oh, these are good first issues across all of the repos we have contributing to the stack. And usually the issues have very good explanations. Like we're making sure that anybody can pick that up and says, this is the problem statement. This is uh, implementation notes, how we think it could be solved. We're very open to your experience. So you want to contribute those. And the last way would be to actually uh, contribute indirectly by sponsoring us. So you can go to um, Riot Mail as well, and you'll see a sponsor button there that you can click on and takes you to GitHub sponsors. Or alternatively, if you just want to hang out and see how all this stuff gets made, you can go to uh, my live stream, Twitch TV slash Leostera, down in the show notes, and just hang out there with us, sub, and have fun. Awesome. Leostera, Leo, thank you so much for coming on, man. I'll talk to you later. Thank you, Lane. Have a great one. Cheers. Cheers.